because the whole theory is a mouthful and that's what I'm going to be talking about all day. So I'm going to try to narrow it down in a way to make it accessible. But first let me say thank you so much for having me. I um, have wanted to visit you all at USU for a long time in main part because my good friend Jen Peoples is on the faculty here. Um, but when Christina invited me out to come consult on the grant she's working on, I was flattered and excited and I've gotten a chance to see the campus today and meet with some of your undergrads, Morgan and Aubrey, and listen to Christina talk about her research and listen to Claire talk about his theory, and already I'm so excited, and your department reminds me a lot of mine in that there is a lot of rigor with the family feel. So I feel really excited to be here, and thank you for welcoming me. Um, so my talk is about narratives and sense-making, so will you permit me to start with a story? How could I not, right? <laughs> so when I... Um, what, when I graduated from college, I worked for a promotional marketing agency, and that wasn't the most satisfying thing I ever did. And so I decided that I would go back to grad school to become a professor. And I was <coughs> home at my parents, and my aunt said to me, my mom's sister, one day, just out of the blue, something that other people might have been thinking, but nobody said. And she said, why do you want to be a professor? You're so fun. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, what do you mean? Shouldn't professors be fun? And I remember that story, and I tell it a lot for a few different reasons. One, I use that story to remind myself of who I want to be as a professor. So I believe that professors should be fun and interesting and rigorous and supportive and all of those things. And so her framing it in that way helped me to enter the academy with the idea that you can be both fun and smart and do good research um, and be a good teacher. Uh, that helps me also socialize my graduate students. So I work in a PhD program at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, and a lot of times my students will get to that point in their program where they're like, I cannot do this. I don't, I don't, how could I be an academic forever? This is so much work and it's so many things to think about. And I tell them that story and say, the most or the best part of my job is the creative and fun part of it. Academia is a place where you can be your most creative self because we get to create research projects and ultimately programs and theories that showcase our creativity and our ability to think outside of the box. And I can already tell from the conversations that I've had with some of you and about you that you all are doing that at the undergraduate level um, in some pretty amazing ways. So I tell the story, socialize my grad students, and then, although this isn't my purpose in telling the story today, the story also serves the function of coping. My aunt recently, the aunt who wondered why I wasn't going to be fun anymore, um, <laughs> recently <laughs> passed away after a treacherous battle with dementia. And this story reminds me of a time when she was fun, and she was herself, and it helps me both remember and cope. So, the functions of narratives and storytelling, the reasons we tell stories, are vast. So they help us create our identity, who I want to be as an academic. They help socialize other people into values, norms, beliefs, and roles. And they also help us make sense of and cope with potentially difficult situations in our lives. And that is what I have dedicated my research to, how people communicate to make sense of relationships and difficulties. And at the heart of all of that is, maybe I have to press the arrows rather than the mouse. <laughs> at the heart of all of that is this notion that provides the overall philosophy for my teaching, research, parenting, hopefully, friending, and romantic relationship, is that the quality of your communication is linked to the quality of your life. That's the premise that guides everything that I do. And I've completely borrowed it from John Stewart. Many of the UW alums in the room have either taught his class and used this very same phrase. Um, but this is what's guided now almost 20 years of work on communicated sense making, is how do we find the links between the ways in which people communicate and fare better in the world? Um, so with that, foundation, what I'd like to do in my talk today 
is talk to you a little bit about what I like to call our strange brand of narrative research. I was told that there would be some folklorists here. Are there? Hi. <laughs> and so maybe I just say this to the folklorists in the rooms or other qualitative researchers. I take a really different approach to narrative than most people. And so I want to talk about what we call our strange brand of narrative. Um, and then also talk about the ways in which we've developed a theory that we call communicated narrative sense making that helps to explain those links between narrative storytelling and well being by highlighting for you several of the findings that we have derived from our empirical studies. Um, and I think I just heard my phone text, which means I'm the worst presenter in the world and didn't turn it off because we're starting to talk. So let me do that. <clears throat> So um, given the philosophy that I have, one of the things that's been really important to me is this idea of in my scholarship linking storytelling and health. Um, I had the privilege, not this past uh, November, but the November before, of responding to um, a, uh, responding on a panel to a book of a man named Art Bachner. How many people know who Art Bachner is? Okay, so he is a professor in our field who is one of the people that has really helped to um, put some narrative research on the map. He um, is very well known for his scholarship and he wrote a book called Coming to Narrative, A History of Paradigm Change in the Social Sciences. And the book itself is all about how he rejected positivist um, scientific empiricism and moved toward qualitative interpretive methods including narratives and autoethnography. Um, and so I was invited to respond to this panel, and I would consider myself a post-positivist quantitative scholar <laughs> who probably does exactly what Art Faulkner does not want me to do. So I agreed hesitantly, and then I said, I entitled my paper, Confessions of a Post-Positivist Who Studies Narrative. <laughs> um, and, but I loved his book and responded favorably in a number of different ways. But the one piece that I took issue with was the dichotomy that he set up between what he calls empiricists and interpretivists. <clears throat> so Bachner, who um, helped to bring narrative methods and the narrative turn about in the social sciences in the 80s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, um, would suggest that empiricists and interpretivists don't speak the same language. In fact, we are in different universes of discourse and we can't really understand each other because we don't share similar goals. In particular, he describes empiricists as people who want to predict and control human behavior and interpretivists as those who want to understand human beings and help them decide what to do. Now, I don't disagree that at the heart of how we teach research methods and how we might introduce paradigms to people, that these are the terms that we would use to describe these different approaches to research and lenses with, through which we see the world. However, I've always thought that there's more to the story than this stark dichotomy because most empiricists that I know actually also want to understand human beings and help them decide what to do. And I'm one of those people. I always had an interest in how do people make sense? What are the stories they tell? What's the richness of the way that they are talking to other people in order to cope with their lives? But I also wanted to know how those processes related to things like health outcomes. And so in our research, what I call our strange brand of narrative, I've tried to add to that story by describing what I call a new narrative term, which is one in which narrative research can be both guided by the principles of prediction and control using some quantitative research method, and also Acknowledging the fact that even though we can understand, um, even though we can understand things through prediction and control, that the world is socially constructed, and that that social construction, that richness, that individual experience that all of you have, can happen in patterned ways, and that's what we seek to understand at this intersections of the ways in which we can predict, control, or explain, 
and also understand human beings and help them decide what to do. Um, and so it was within that context that one of my former graduate students and I sat down to write a chapter for the SAGE Handbook on Family Communication that we titled Communicated Narrative Sensemaking. And we wrote this chapter in which we introduced this model um, with both selfish and altruistic motivations. Selfishly, I was bored with the chapters that I had written before where I was trying to wrangle all this literature on narrative and storytelling and make something of it. And I wanted to talk about what we did, but also I was sick of trying to describe to my friends what we do.